What's up, Real Life Church? So good to be with you, if, uh, whether you're inside or outside, and a special hello to our Canyon Country folks, and also hello to our online audience. I just want to take a quick second, if you're watching online, hey, I'm going to be with you after the message today to do a Q&A, and so I would love if during the message today you have any questions that you want to get answered, go ahead and put those in the chat, talk to our campus pastor, David Park, there, and uh, I will be joining you guys after the message today. But for those of you who don't know, my name is Michael, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's so good to be with you today. If this is your first time or first time in a long time, we are in a series called Jonah. And the goal of this series is that we would love it if everyone who's a part of Real Life Church would, would just spend the next couple of weeks reading alongside of us as we journey in this book to gain some wisdom and insight around this idea that God doesn't just abandon us when, he, when we run from him. In fact, God does the opposite of abandoning. God actually pursues us even though we are running from him because of his great love for you and I. And he does the opposite of that. And so that's what we're talking about. As Sean mentioned, we created this really great resource called the Daily Bible Reading, where each and every day um, we will send you via the RLC app, or if you sign up on the website, we'll send you a devotion that our awesome adult ministry pastors have worked on. And it's going to cover the uh, 20 days. We've broken Jonah down into 20 days, and we would love it if you would just journey alongside of us as we all grow together uh, through the book of Jonah as well. Well, Rusty mentioned this last week, and I want to just do a little bit of recap for us. As you may or may not know, the Bible is broken up into 66 individual books. And on one side, the individual books paint a really great picture of what we, fascinating picture of what we see in the first century of the world. But as a collective, all those 66 books together shows us uh, God's plan to reconnect a disconnected creation through Jesus. And now, and the Bible is also broken up into two major categories. So we have the New Testament, which consists of all the writings uh, after the life of Jesus, including the four autobiographies, eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life that we refer to as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then we have the Old Testament. Now, within the Old Testament, we see different forms of books that make up the Old Testament. Some which have, a, or all of them, which all have historical content. Some which are about some of the laws, some of the religious laws we saw in the first century. We also have poetic books. And then we have books that speak to future predictions or as what they refer to as prophecy. Now, Jonah would be one of those prophetic books that we see. And there are two schools of thoughts or two schools of category where people land in when it comes to the book of Jonah, okay? The first thought is that, you know, Jonah is more of a figurative, poetic book, that this story really didn't happen in, the, in real life, that it's a made-up metaphor, it's a made-up story, and it's a metaphor that has real-life implications and meaning for us. Like, we can still gain wisdom from it, even though maybe you don't believe that it happened in real life. Because, I mean, let's be honest. It's kind of hard to believe that a big fish swallowed this man and that this man lived inside of a fish for three days and three nights. I mean, for some of us, that's just kind of hard to believe. In fact, I heard this story once about this elementary teacher who was teaching her class about whales, and she was explaining that whales are really big and that whales eat a lot of fish, a lot of sm small fish. And a little girl in her classroom raised her hand and said, well, Jonah was eaten by a big whale. And the elementary teacher said, no, 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 that's not true. And the little girl said, no, it is true, teacher. I read it in the Bible. And the elementary teacher is like, no, that's a fairy tale. The Bible's a fairy tale. All of that's a fairy tale. It's not true. And the little girl goes, no, it is true. And when I get to heaven, I'll ask Jonah, and he'll tell me it's true. <clears throat> and the teacher, getting frustrated, said, well, what if Jonah's in hell? And the little girl goes, well, if he's in hell, then you can ask him. <laughs> right? It's, it's hard. I get it. It's totally hard to believe that uh, a big fish swallowed this guy and he got to live in there. And, and, you know, let's just be honest. Fish stories are already exaggerated. Right, men? Right? Let's go ahead and be real. 
Nobody does it like we do, right? My wife reminds me all the time that us men, we have the uh, extraordinary God-given gift to exaggerate or stretch the truth, especially when it comes to accomplishments and fishing, right? Because, you know, the story always starts off about here, and then about six months later, the fish was this big, and then about a year later, the fish was this big, and then 10 years later, you had the Coast Guard come in and help you catch the fish, and it was massive, right? Like, we... We we all have those fish stories, whether it's stories like that that we've exaggerated or stories where we've killed our little kids' fish and we told them they went to fishy heaven in the toilet, right? Or what about this fish story in this scene from The Office? Thanks for coming down, Daryl. It was nice meeting you, Daryl. I think you'd fit in great here. (sighs) Yeah, yeah, me too. I think it'd be like, (laughs) you know what? I think it'd be like a Kevin Durant jump shot. Perfecto. So, yeah, we all have stories like that, right? Now, there are other parts, other people who fall in the other category that says that actually, no, Jonah was, is a real historical, literal account of something happening, of a big, great fish swallowing this man, that this story actually happened in real life, and that he actually lived in the belly of this great fish for three full days and three full nights. In fact, as Rusty mentioned last week, there's scientific evidence that proves that there are certain fish that could actually hold a human inside of them. And that makes me confirm and reaffirm my belief that you should not go out past like maybe a couple miles outside of the ocean. Because here's the thing, I'm always, I mean, I'm a sinner and I don't want to end up in the belly of a well at some point. So I don't really like to be out on cruise ships or carnival cruises because you just never know who might be willing to throw you over. Like, Like ain't nobody got time for that, right? Now, It's okay if you are somebody who lives in like, no, I think this is a metaphor. I think this is not real life. It's totally fine if that is you. If you're under the impression that it's a metaphorical story meant to teach us some wisdom. Let me tell you where I'm at. I actually believe that this story happened in real life. Here's why. And Rusty kind of briefly touched on this, but I want to dive a little bit deeper. And one of Jesus' first followers, a guy by the name of Matthew, we've mentioned him before, he captures this moment in which, in the retelling of of Jesus' story, where Jesus actually brings this up. You see, Jesus was surrounded by some religious leaders, and they came to Jesus, and they, they wanted Jesus to show them a sign. They wanted Jesus to prove that he was really the Son of God, that he really had the authority to say what he was saying. And if you go back to our Mastermind series, you remember I talked about this idea that proof is only good enough for a conviction, not a relationship. You see, they wanted conviction. Jesus wanted the relationship. So in response to their demand for a sign, this is what Jesus says to them. He says, only an evil and adulterous generation would demand a miraculous sign. But the only sign I will give them is the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was in the belly of a great fish for three days and three nights, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. Hmm. Interesting that Jesus uses the exact same circumstance which happened thousands of years ago to Jonah to compare what would eventually happen to him. Now remember, we say this all the time. This is a person who predicted his own death in resurrection. And if you can predict your own death and resurrection and actually make it happen, I'm, we're likely going to listen to everything else you said. And so that's why for me, I actually think this story happened in real life. So here's where we ended up last week with the story. So Jonah, again, if you weren't here, Jonah's this prophet uh, who, who, who was sent by God to go to this place called Nineveh. And Nineveh is this city in the country of, of Assyria, and it, Nineveh is just wild. And God sends Jonah there to tell them, hey, God's wrath is coming for you unless you turn from your evil ways. Now, but Jonah doesn't want to go. And there's many reasons why he doesn't want to go. But one surefire reason was the fact that the Ninevites were cruel people. 
I mean, they would use unspeakable tactics of murder to basically keep their enemies at bay. One of the tactics they would use is that they would take people and they would literally skin them, all, their entire skin, and make like a bodysuit of skin and hang it on the city walls as a warning to anybody that thought they would try to attack Nineveh. So I don't know about you, but if I'm driving by a town and there's skin suits hanging on the wall somewhere, I'm not likely to say we need to stop and grab gas here, right? And Jonah's like, yeah, this ain't happening. And so Jonah decides that those people, the Ninevites, are not worth the trouble, and he decides to go in the complete opposite direction of Nineveh. God tells him to go there, and he says, no, peace out, I'm going this way. Now, can you imagine doing that in your own life? God literally saying, hey, I need you to go here, and you're like, nah, God, I got other plans. It'd be like if God told you to go to Victorville and you ended up in Seattle. Like, this is too, that, that's complete, that, that's not where you needed to be, right? So while on this journey away from Nineveh, Jonah boards this ship with some sailors. And he decides to take a nap, and a storm comes, and the sailors are freaking out because they have no idea why this crazy storm, when it was just perfectly sunny sh sunshine outside, is now happening. And so they start freaking out, and Jonah, they, after they wake up Jonah, Jonah realizes, oh yeah, this is for me. This is what happens when you rebel against God. And so Jonah understands that unless he gets thrown overboard, this storm is going to wipe out the entire ship and kill everybody on it, right? So he has the sailors throw him overboard, and God sends this great fish to swallow Jonah, and he stays in the belly of this great fish for three days and three nights. Now, regardless if you're willing to admit this, I believe that all of us can find ourselves in this story. Why? Because we're all Jonah at some point in time in our lives. And a lot of us, multiple times. Think about this. Some of us grew up going to church, right? And because of whatever reason it was, maybe you just started hating church. And when you got older, you ran away from church and you ran away from God. Now, years later, you view God like the home you left when you were 18. Like, it's there if you need it, but you don't want really anything to do with it. And some of us here in the room outside watching online, we're interested in God. We go to church, and we, we're even part of a community group. We even do life with other people. We might even serve. But there, there's maybe one or two areas in our life that we aren't ready to give over to God, right? Like, we, like maybe it's our finances, or maybe it's our, 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 our dreams, maybe it's our family, Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's addiction, maybe it's pride, maybe it's an inappropriate relationship that we're in, maybe it's our, 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 our jobs, maybe it's our political ideology. Whatever it is, we're like, no, God, you can have all that, but you can't touch this. Mm -mm, not messing with this. And so what we do is we take that area and we run from God with it. And that's where we find Jonah. He's on the run because he's unwilling to listen to what God wanted for him and from him. So last week we talked about this idea that the first thing we have to do is we got, we got to stop running. We need to stop running. Today what I want to talk about is God's posture and attitude towards those who run from him and where he's at in this process of running, okay? So chapter 2 begins with Jonah inside the belly of this great fish. And as any of us would do if we ever found ourselves in the belly of a great fish, I'd imagine that we'd all begin to pray. And that's what Jonah starts to doing. He starts to pray to God. And what I want to look at and what I truly believe we can see is the attitude and posture of God because Jonah's prayer isn't a prayer for God to come rescue him, which most of us would probably be praying like, hey, can you make this whale like die and land on a beach somewhere, right? But that's not Jonah's prayer. It's not a prayer of rescue. His prayer is a prayer of truth about who God is and God's mercy on Jonah. So what I want to do is I want to start here in chapter 2, <clears throat> starting at verse 1, okay? And it will be on the screen for you or on your Bible app if you have it. Here's what Jonah says. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from inside the fish. And he said, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called to you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. 
You threw me into the ocean depths, and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, O oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence, yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves, and the waters closed over me. Seaweed wrapped itself around my head. I sank down to the very roots of the mountain. I was imprisoned in the earth, whose gates locked shut forever. But you, O oh Lord, my God, snatched me from the jaws of death, and my life was slipping away. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord, and my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their backs on all God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifices to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows, for my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit Jonah out on the beach. Man, what a prayer. I mean, it's a very honest and very raw prayer that Jonah prays because I get the sense that he realized that he had messed up by deliberately doing the exact opposite of what God wanted him to do. And I don't know about you, but I, I am, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I, I'm very much just like Jonah. I'm very much just like that. When I know that I've done something wrong and it's the exact thing that God uh, has warned me to stay away from and warned me not to do and I end up doing it anyways, can I be honest that in my prayer time, there's no hiding from God. There's not like, hey, God, everything's great because God knows everything's not great, right? There's no pretending that everything is great and hunky-dory. It's really about confession and repentance. And that word repentance means it's just another way of saying that I have to own up to my mistakes and allow God's spirit to continue his work in me to help me grow from my, my mistakes. So in, when I realize I've done wrong, it's confession and it's repentance. Confession and turning away from my mistakes. And that's what Jonah does. He doesn't mince words. He gets to the heart of the action. But what I want to zero in on and what I want you to really just, just, just kind of hold on to and look at is God's attitude through the lens of Jonah's perspective, God's attitude and posture in all of this. Because I think it's so key to understanding who God is and especially his attitude and posture towards those who run from him. And th there are a few things I think that really stick out that I want to I show you. Here's the first one. God listens to us even when we're on the run. Think about that. God listens to us even when we're on the run. Jonah prays, I cried out to the Lord in my great trouble, and he answered me. I called you from the land of the dead, and Lord, you heard me. Now, this is really fascinating to me because the immediate thought that comes to my mind when I, when I read this and when I think about the story of Jonah is why in the world would God listen to someone or really anyone who says, you know what, God, I don't think you're good enough. I'm going to go the other way. Like, why would God do that? Why would God be willing to listen to somebody who's calling out for help now? Like, it's too late. In my mind, it's like, it's too late. You ignored my command. But yet Jonah says God listened to him. Now, I've mentioned this before, but, um, you know, my mom, she was a great lady, but, you know, my mom didn't mess around when it came to discipline. I think she enjoyed it, actually. I think she would look forward to it, like, when are one of these kids going to get in trouble? Mwah! Because she did not mess around. Like, when it came to me and my sisters and we committed a disobedient act, especially after being warned several times, the time for listening was over, Right? The time was listening. I remember several instances where after I was like in trouble and I knew that I was about to get a whooping, which is different than a whooping, just so you know, okay? A whooping, a whooping is like the really nice, cordial, child protective services won't arrest you kind of thing that you do, right? That's a whooping. It's like a nice little spanking. But a whooping, especially in the African-American family, means you, you won't be able to sit down for several days, okay? And so when I was about to get a whooping, right, you know, my mom would grab her favorite little belt with the, with the holes in it. For some of you, it may have been a switch or the, or the you know, la chancla, and if you, depending on what your family history is, right? But you knew that once your parent got to that time and space, 
It was done. There was no trying to argue your way out of it. You about to get a whooping, right? And in that sense, I imagine that God would be just like that. Like, hey, Jonah, mm -mm, it's time. You're going to get a whooping, right? But God does the exact opposite. He listens. He listens to Jonah in the belly of this great fish. While, I mean, he does that while on this thing. Jonah talks about making his cry from the land of the dead. Did you catch that? Now, what he's referring to is this place that in the first century, any first century person reading this would automatically understand that this land of the dead is a place absent of God. It, and, and it's not just about being a non-existent. It's about being non-existent and not being present with God. We understand that the day we take our last breath, if we're followers of Jesus, we're going to be with Jesus. Jonah makes a reference to taking his last breath and being separated from Jesus, which is a much, much worse situation to even consider yourself to be in. And that's what Jonah feels like. He feels like God didn't even like listen. Like, he feels like he's apart away from God. But the thing is, God didn't even have to listen. He didn't have to do anything. Remember, God's not the one running. It's Jonah that's running. Jonah's the one that made the bad decision. And now he's facing the consequences of his choices. And in the midst of that, he speaks this profound truth about God's attitude and posture, even towards him when he's on the run. Now, I don't know if you're gas, you're, you're, you're getting what I'm saying here. So let me expound on this. We have this Shiba Inu dog. I don't know if you've ever seen a Shiba Inu. It's a great, cute little looking fox kind of dog. And when we leave the house, we put the dog outside because we don't want it to do anything stupid in our house, right? So we go and we have fun and we run our er uh, errands and we do all the things we want to do, right? And then we come home and literally as I I mean, I just put the key in the door, and I can already hear the glass pounding on the back door because our dog knows we're home, right? And what he expects is that when we get home that we're going to spend hours just rubbing his disgusting belly. That's all he ever wants us to do, right? But we're not about that life. Like, we're trying to come home and go to bed, right? And so we have this expectation that that dog is going to be pretty and cute and cuddly, and it will only serve us on our time, not his time. Now, do you realize that we treat God just like that? Right? We keep God inside this box, and we say, we lock him up in the church, or we lock him up in the Bible, and we say, stay here, God, until I need you. We go out and we do our own thing, even though we do the things that we know God doesn't want us to do. And then when we make a mess of things, who's the first person we run to? God. Because we think he'll fix it all, right? Now, I don't know about you, but if my family or my friends treated me like that, yeah, I'm going to stop listening to them. I'm not going to answer their calls, but not God. In spite of our running, in spite of our disobedience, in spite of our failures, we have a God who listens to our cries for help even when we run. Here's the other thing that I, I noticed in, in Jonah's prayer. God will step in, God will sometimes step in and stop our running. He will. Jonah, say, or Jonah says this in his prayer. He says, you threw me into the ocean depths and I sank down to the heart of the sea. The mighty waters engulfed me. I was buried beneath your wild and stormy waves. Then I said, oh Lord, you have driven me from your presence. Yet I will look once more towards your holy temple. I sank beneath the waves and the waters closed over me. Seaweeds wrapped itself around my head and I sank down to the very roots of the mountain." I was imprisoned in the earth who gates locked shut forever. You see, Jonah felt like God had rejected him in that part of the prayer, that God had abandoned him and left him for dead. But, but I want to point out something that sometimes I think we miss when we read this story. You see, God didn't hurl Jonah into the sea. He didn't throw Jonah into the sea. The sailors did. The sailors were the ones who threw Jonah into the sea. But Jonah realized that they were who God used to make a point to him. You see, the sailor, the fish, it was all part of God's plan to stop Jonah from running. 
Now, and, and here's something that you will discover about some of the circumstances in your life. Like the debt that's overtaking you or the bad decision that you, that's about to take you down or the people that you've made mad or, or the parents who took away your freedom or the friends who did the intervention. One day, you're going to look back on that and you're going to say, God was in that. That God was in that not to pay you back, but to bring you back. You're going to look back on those times where it felt like everyone was against you, where life was against you, and you're going to realize that God was in that to bring you back. You see, when we run from God, oftentimes God will allow the consequences of our decisions to stop us from running any further. Why? Because he wants what's best for us. Uh, as my uh, group leader, Ho Charles and Holly, said so beautifully at our, at our group meeting the other night, God isn't after parts of you. He is after you holistically. He wants all of you. So he will use or allow things that will get you to stop so he can transform you into who you were created to be. For Jonah, it was being thrown over a boat. But for some of us, it might be a rehab center. For some of us, it might be a separation, and that might, separation might come in our marriage or in our dating or in our friends or maybe even a job. It might be a close call with your health because you've been ignoring it. It might even be a distaste for everything. You realize that, you know what, you're not content with anything in your life, and you can't find satisfaction. You know, honestly, we'll never know which of those God might have caused and which he just allowed to happen. But what we do know is that God will use that and cause that to stop us from running. And if some of you were honest, that's the reason why you're here at church today. You know, we meet people each and every week who have met pain in their life, and somehow they have found their way to church because it seemed like the only place that they could have some relief from the pain. Now, I know that hearing that, for some of you, made you really begin to question God. You might be thinking, well, look, I don't like that about God, that he can cause these things to happen. I don't like that. Maybe you're like this girl who tried kombucha for the first time, okay? Right? You're like, okay, God, I, I, I like this idea about God, right? And then you heard that God might cause things or allow things to stop you from running, and then this is the face you made, like, no, I'm not about that life, right? Mm -mm, I don't like that. That's not what I, what I want. Can I be honest with you? I also, as a pastor, I don't fully understand why he does what he does. I don't. But what I do know and what I believe that will help you go from this phase to that phase is this idea and this understanding of comparison. Because think about this. Isn't this what a loving parent does for their kid? Think about that, right? If you're a parent, don't we do things to get our kids' attention and to help them see that when they're about to make a wrong choice or to teach them a lesson about a wrong choice they've made? Why do we do that? Because we love them and we know that unless we step in to either create circumstances which restrict them or allow them to make a bad choice, they're going to keep making bad choices and they'll never learn from it. So if we as imperfect parents can do that with our imperfect kids, well then what could a perfect God do with his imperfect creation? God is doing the very same thing that we are doing with our own kids. So God steps in often, and he will stop us from running. And here's, here's the last thing we see in Jonah's prayer. God has a bailout plan. God has a bailout plan. Jonah writes this, he says, But you, O Lord my God, snatched me from the jaws of death. As my life was slipping away, I remembered the Lord. And my earnest prayer went out to you in your holy temple. Those who worship false gods turn their back on all of God's mercies. But I will offer sacrifice to you with songs of praise, and I will fulfill all my vows. For my salvation comes from the Lord alone. Then the Lord ordered the fish to spit out Jonah onto the beach. You see, right in the middle of Jonah's prayer, I get the sense that he finally recognized the error of his decision. And right there in the belly of this great fish, 
Jonah yields to God. He basically humbles himself and decides that running was never the answer. That God is good and that his ways are always the best ways, even when Jonah didn't agree with them. And in that recognition, Jonah repents. Now, that word repent basically means he has a sincere remorse about his decision, and he decides that he's going to correct it and commit to following God wherever God asks him to go, even if. Now, you see, that, that phrase, even if, it doesn't come with conditions. It doesn't come with a, well, Jesus, I'll follow you only if you. No, it doesn't that. Jonah cries out to God and basically says, God, I know I've been running from what you want from me, and I am done running. And I'm going to do what you believe is best for me. It may not look like what I wanted. I may have to go to some crazy place. People be skinning people, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to trust you because you know better than me. You're going to work these circumstances out for my good and your glory. And that's when Jonah finally comes to this point. And that's when God causes the great fish to spit Jonah out. Only after Jonah relinquished his idea of what was good for him over to God and he stopped running. Can I tell you, it's time for you, if you've been doing that, if you've been running, it's time. It's time to stop running. And surrender yourself over to what God wants for you. It may not look like what you thought it was going to look like. It may not be what you thought was best for you. It may not be what you've always dreamed of. But I promise you that if you surrender to God, it will be what is needed. Because you have to understand that God's best is better than your best or your idea of best. So here's what I want to do to end our time. I would just love for everybody, whether you're inside or outside watching online, just to hold out your hand. I can see you, so just go ahead and put your hand out. Just hold out your hand. We've all been running from God in some form, some fashion, some shape, some area of our life. And I'm telling you today, it is time to relinquish that running. It's time to stop. There are some areas in your life I just know the Spirit is telling you, it's speaking in your heart right now. There are some area in your life that you need to give over to God. And so I'm just going to just kind of mention some of those areas. Man, and if that's you, will you be willing to just say, God, that's me. Here it is. For some of you, there's an addiction that you're just kind of holding on to. It's providing some kind of relief. It's making you kind of get through a tough season. You're holding on to it like it's a, a crutch, and you don't know how to get rid of it. Would you be willing to just kind of hand this over to God? For some of you, it's a sin. It's a bad decision. It's a, it's a choice you keep making over and over again that you know is leading you further away from what God wants for you. Would you be willing to hand that over? For some of you, you got a lot of hate in your heart right now. Whether it's toward an ex, whether it's toward an ex-neighbor, ex-wife, ex-friend, son, father, somebody who looks different than you, someone who thinks politically different than you, whatever it is, you got a lot of hate in your heart. And the God of the universe doesn't hate you even though you've been running from him. Would you be willing to give that over to God? Some of you need forgiveness. And some of you need to accept that forgiveness. You've been running from that forgiveness. Would you be willing to surrender and say, God, I'm willing to accept forgiveness? Some of you have been running from your marriage. Your spouse has been standing there, arms wide open, saying, if you just gave us a chance, we can make this work. 
Would you be willing to come back to your marriage? Some of you have been running from church, just in general. You got comfortable during the pandemic. And now the Spirit is telling you that the only way you're going to find community, the only way you're going to find relationship, the only way you're going to find wholeness and people to walk with you in whatever season you're in is to be a part of a body of people who care and love you and are willing to walk with you, whether that's digitally or physically. Will you be willing to come home? And some of you, Jesus has been saying, I want to change your life. I want to show you my best. Will you follow him? Will you say yes to Jesus tonight? Wherever you are, whatever it is that the Spirit is doing in your life, I am asking you, submit, come home like Jonah and say, Lord, even when I was left for dead, you still listen and you stop me in my tracks and you're providing a better way. Jesus, we thank you for, God, what you did in the life of Jonah. We thank you for the well that you provided, God. That in that great fish, Jonah surrendered all he had, all he was. He surrendered his thoughts to life, what he thought was best, and he surrendered it all for the best that you were preparing for him. God, I pray that we could do the same, that we could just say, God, you are better than anything we've ever hoped, any way that we could take any step or any guidance in our life, God. We surrender it all to you. And Lord, I know that it's only in that time when we relinquish that, that you will show us glory and wonder. We pray this in Jesus' name. And the house said,